Working Cows Podcast, episode 354. This episode is brought to you by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. This episode is also brought to you by Ranch Right. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the Understanding Ag Studios. And this episode is brought to you by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. If you're in the business of managing livestock, you've probably experienced drought, shortage of time, not enough help, and hefty debt. But facing one or even all of these challenges doesn't have to leave you worrying about how you'll make it through another year. Learn how to increase your stocking rates, extend your grazing season, increase plant diversity, retain moisture in your soil, spend less time and money on weed control, and much more at one of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition's grazing schools. During this three-day intensive program, area producers along with presenters from state and local agencies combine hands-on activities in the field with classroom-style presentations to walk you through the steps necessary to create a grazing plan that suits your unique operation. Reserve your spot at one of the three grazing schools today at sdgrass.org. Very excited to be joined today by Cooper Hibbard. Cooper is uh, one of the members of the team there at Seben Land and Livestock. I've talked to him a little bit about the history of that ranch before. That episode will be linked in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 354. And I uh, encourage you to go check that out. Uh, very, very interesting operation they've got there. And we're going to talk to him today about composite breeds and the importance of composite breeds for succeeding in grazing and what the composite breeds are able to do for them as they uh, as they continue to develop these composites that are perfectly adapted or very well adapted to their environment. So Cooper, thanks for joining me again today on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back. Thank you, Clay. It's good to be back. So I, <laughs> I was climbing over the fence today into the barnyard where I've got a, a Jersey heifer and a uh, red Angus, kind of maybe an Irish red bull. And, I, and it's, the wind chill this morning was 20 below zero. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm asking a lot of a Jersey heifer from the Jersey region in England to come here and to thrive because it doesn't get 20 below in Jersey. <laughs> they, and they get whatever they get, 60 inches of rain a year and they've got different soils and they've got this and they've got that, you know? And so I, it kind of was, was, uh, I don't know how you want to say it. I red pilled myself. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I just, I, I had this moment of clarity, like, we're asking these animals to thrive in an environment so different from the one that they are, they, that, you know, whatever it is, hundreds or thousands of generations of them have, have, uh, been in and, and now we're asking them to come and do that well. And so then it further down that thought process was, well, maybe the answer rather than trying to find one particular breed is to develop a composite breed that can do well in our environment, in our zip code. And even in America, that's going to be vastly different because central Montana, West central Montana is vastly different from Missouri, is vastly different from Virginia, you know, and so is vastly different from Florida. And so we we have all these different variations. And, and just to think that we can grab one particular breed and bring them here and expect them to adapt is a big ask. Do you, would you agree with that? Wholeheartedly. Yeah, I would. I think that's well said. So what, what has been your experience with composite breeds? Um, so my, my experience with composite breeds dates back to 
oh, probably 2006, my uncle Chase, who has managed a ranch for nearly 45 years, he started bringing on some black composites in 2006 or so um, from Radakovich's in Iowa. And um, actually, when he when he brought it, when he brought them on, it was a big family discussion. I remember all the emails going back and forth and uh, about the benefits of composites. And so we had these composites side by side with low input black Angus bulls um, from renowned bloodlines and running our environment and um, became pretty clear that the composites were just a hardier animal. Um, and that was on the front end of that black composite being developed. And then, it, of course, through the years, it's gotten better and better. And then um, so through that exposure, I became a real believer in composites and and not just exposure to on the ground and seeing them phenotypically and how they how they handled themselves in this environment and how they held up. Um, but also being exposed to the science behind composites, which is... I believe in the 1980s, uh, two main studies out of the Mean Animal Research Center from Clay Center really captured the strength and benefit in having these composites and why composites work. So the science behind it, um, and I think you and I touched on this in that last episode where you and I visited, so I'll just try and glass over it so we're all on the same page, but... <clears throat> Basically, if you have a true composite would be five or more breeds under one hide. And if you have that genetic um, variation within one animal, then you capture about 88%, 83 to 88% heterosis. Heterosis is your hybrid vigor. And a F1 cross, so a black baldy cross would have a 100% heterosis, 100% hybrid vigor. But then when that calf becomes a cow and has a calf, that second generation, the heterosis is diluted by half. And then with each consecutive generation, it get, gets diluted by half. And so it becomes, if you're going to try and maintain some sort of hybrid vigor, um, a higher percentage of hybrid vigor, then you really need to have a very complex breeding program. Or you can use a true composite and capture that 88% heterosis effect that does not get diluted from one generation to the next. And um, that has a very tangible result and um, correlation to actual functionality on the ground with better milking ability, higher longevity, more fertility, more resistance to disease, um, higher doability on grass, like 30% fewer calories needed to um, mm. get the same result as one study that I saw. And so it's very real. And so rewind eight, eight years ago, I was exposed to Johan Zeitzman from Africa, and he's a real believer in composites. But his take on it is um, that the heterosis effect is just a, a, side benefit the real effect is to your point mixing and matching breeds to better fit your environment and so once i read through him then i, I just kind of doubled down on on how important composites are for functional genetics if you're in, in an operation that really has taken out the crutch from underneath your cows and are relying more on them to work with mother nature and perform without too much of a, without being too propped up. Is that content from Zeitzman? Is that in his book, man, can cattle and veld? Is that where you found that? It is. Yep. Yep. So I want to back up to the beginning of, of the history of, uh, composites at Seabin land and livestock. And you, you said 2006 and they came out of Iowa. Um, can you, Tell me what what prompted even looking. Do you know why Chase was even willing to look somewhere for composites? You know, um, I don't really know the genesis of that 
story. I think I do know that he and Steve Radakovich were both part of this group called Western Ranch Managers hmm. group um, that would meet annually. And Steve is uh, a fascinating, very knowledgeable, very savvy cattleman. And he understood the science and the power of this, the science behind composites. And um, so he, he, I think starting in the seventies or eighties started a composite. And then he also doubled down on that once, it, once the science came out from meat animal research center. And so anyways, it was through conversations with Steve Radakovich um, that uncle chase was exposed to this concept and really wanted to, and then through that relationship, wanted to experiment with these bulls and, and help Steve Radakovich kind of, you know, be a sounding board for developing these. We'd put them through, you know, a real world Montana ranch, rough country test. And I think that was valuable for, for both parties because before that, Steven mostly had a, I, I think he mostly had a red composite herd and, and he started a black composite herd in the early two thousands. Is my recollection. Anyways. Sure. Yep. Do you remember what the composite was comprised of? Yeah. So Radakovich's composites, again, to my recollection would be black and red Angus, Hereford, Simmental, Gelby, Shorthorn, I believe Barzona, and I believe Cinepole. And I think they had just a like a splash at Tarente in there way mm-hmm. back when. Yep. And is the is the Barzona are, are are all of those English or continental breeds, or is the Barzona an African breed? I don't uh the Barzona is actually a composite. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm probably gonna misspeak here, but it, I know, I think it's short horn mm-hmm. and either Hereford or Red Angus and maybe Brahma. Uh-huh. Sure. And then the Cinepole is more of a, uh, African influenced breed from the Caribbean. You, you brought them to Montana and put them on low input Angus, black Angus cows. Is that right? Yeah. For the most part. I mean, it's just a classic commercial herd. We'd been meaning <laughs> we were Hereford, you know, sixties through the eighties. And there's, I don't know what else in there. A lot of Simmental at some point, probably in the eighties. So it was just kind yep. of a classic rainbow herd. Um, by the time the early nineties rolled around and then black Angus became really popular and there was more performance, black Angus genetics, just like everyone else chasing feedlot traits and, um, and then by early 2000, we'd switched our calving date from February and March to May and then from May to June. And that really highlighted the different type of cow that we needed to start migrating towards. And that's when the low input black Angus genetics came online. So, yeah, there's a few, would that be six, six years of buying these low input black Angus genetics that these black composites came onto the scene. And it, again, it was an experiment. So majority of the bull battery were low input black Angus genetics. And then, you know, a fraction of it were these black composites. And then that pendulum started to swing to where by 2016, it was about, you know, 95, 98% black composite bulls and the rest being black Angus. Sure. Were there um, common people that people would talk about at that stage as influencing their thinking on these things? Like, would Steve Radakovich have had influences, or would there have been influences even in the low input Black Angus genetics back in those days? Um, you know that you were personally influenced by uh, that that kind of just continued to to shape this process. Oh, certainly the Lassiters. I was, um, Lassiters, I was very fortunate to have, so I spent two years working on a ranch in Colorado after I graduated from college for Duke Phillips, who has since started a company called Ranchlands, and that was just an amazing, incredible experience for me. And uh, Duke Phillips, both senior and junior, and I became very dear friends. But in that process, 
Duke had worked for the Lassiters and the Lassiters started the beef master. They founded the beef master breed, which is also a composite. And if you haven't read the Lassiter, Lassiter philosophy for cattle raising, it's a must read mm. book by Tom Lassiter, who is one of these guys who was just before his time. Um, anyway, while I was working with Duke for, it was about three, three different seasons. I was able to go up and help be a part of Dale Lassiter sorting through their herd sires prior to the bull sale, who they were going to keep for the Lassiter foundation herd and who they were going to sell. And, uh, which was a day long process and just being able to rub, rub shoulders with him and be, be around him and do talk about how their eye for cattle and their thinking behind, um, why they're making the decisions that they, and the sorts that they were. And all of this after I already had the Lassiters on a pedestal, you know, after reading that book and being exposed to it. And so it was just this incredible experience for me. And then prior to that, I'd worked on a ranch in Northern Mexico that was also influenced by the Lassiters. They had some beef masters, but they also had a, a, line bred herd of Herefords that had been closed for at that time it was 43 or 47 years. And it was one of the most beautiful herds of cattle I'd ever seen. Um, and even though it was a line bred herd, they'd instituted for the last 40 years, the Lassiter philosophy of cattle raising. Mm. And, um, the proof was in the proof was in the pudding. And so it was, it was just kind of this mix of, of how to match, not necessarily composites, but just how to how to set up your genetic selection criteria to where you do get cattle that fit the environment. Um, I would say that those those three people, Duke and Dale Lassiter and the Lassiter family, and uh, Tavo Bermudez down in Mexico, were probably who had the biggest impact on me. Yeah. In, my thinking. And then of course, Johann Zeitzman further down the line. Do you think that, do you think that most of these people trace their lineage back to Jan Bonsma or, or are there other names that should be thrown in there as far as earlier guys that were really figuring this stuff out? Yeah. I, I can't speak for the Lassiters of, of who influenced Tom Lassiter. It might've just been him and his observations and yeah. mother nature. Um, but certainly the Bermudez family in Mexico were equally influenced by Jan Bonsma. Yep. And I think that you, you shouldn't undersell or we, nobody should undersell somebody's ability to observe things on their own ranch and make the right decision. Right. Like, uh, I've quoted it now, I think in back to back episodes, maybe depending on how these release, but, uh, uh, Logan Pribino has one of my favorite quotes of all time that the best fertilizer a farmer or a rancher can add to his, his field is his shadow. You know, if you're out there and looking at it and observing it, you know, that it's, it's going, it, it, you will notice things and see things that you wouldn't otherwise see. And so, you know, I, I totally, uh, would say that, that Tom Lasseter just if he had the skills to observe and be willing. And I think the second half of that equation is be willing to do something that nobody else is willing to do, right? Be willing to do something that will make the neighbors think you're crazy or whatever, you know, those two things together. If you, if you're willing to look at it objectively and say, what am I seeing and what does it mean? And then say, okay, that means I should do this. And I don't care what anybody thinks necessarily about what I'm doing because I think it's what's right for my zip code and my style of management. I agree. I think that's how all this came about was people's willingness. Well, first their observation skills and willingness to be honest with what they're seeing and then willingness to experiment in a way that was constructive, like the fail fast, fail cheap, fail forward method, and then learn, learn from that and observe and be honest and, it's just kind of this small feedback loop that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I appreciate that Logan has that quote. We've got a, my great grandmother, I guess always used to say, and so it's stuck with our family, something very similar in that 
the best fertilizer for the soil is the footsteps of its ma- of the master. Mm. Yep. And I, I have a, f- a, f- a friend, one of the, the board members here at the church where I'm a pastor, uh, he's he he's full of proverbial statements, and not all of them come from the book of Proverbs, but one of them is uh, the eye of the master fattens the lamb. You know, huh. that if you're out there looking at them, uh, you'll notice things that you could potentially fix before it's causing an issue. And so, yeah, they're they're all and really what we're talking about is the the journey of mastery too. Yeah, right, yeah. which is um, something that should grip people hopefully <laughs> yeah yeah uh humility right if you're not willing to look back at what you produced 5 years ago or the way you thought 5 years ago and say what was i thinking <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah you have to be completely honest with what you're saying there's no if you're going to progress you, you you can't you can't hide from the truth of what what actually has happened or what is happening and you just can't. Yep. Mother I wanna, Nature makes darn sure of that. I want to tell you a short, funny story because um, I'm looking at this book uh, on Amazon and I'm sure there's a cheaper place to get it. But the the Lasser philosophy of cattle raising it is a signed copy. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, January first, nineteen ninety two is when it was published. It's three hundred ninety nine dollars on Amazon right now for a signed copy. Oof. Yeah, and I, I, there was a, there was another book. I can't even remember what it was now. I can see its cover. It was mostly black and yellow, um, and it was, uh, it was, you know, some some book that, oh, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was thoughts of, and advice from an old cattleman or something like that from Hazard, Gordon Hazard. It might have been that one, but anyways, it doesn't really matter because I was looking for it, and I f- of course you find it on Amazon. You can always find it there, but it was like eleven hundred dollars, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was telling, I was telling, um, I was telling Aaron Berger from University of Nebraska Extension that it was eleven hundred bucks. He's like, "Well, I've got a copy. I'll sell you." And I said, "Well, is it signed?" And he says, "I'll sign it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for for eleven hundred bucks." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, so yeah, I'm sure you can find it cheaper somewhere else. Actually, PowerFlex, maybe that's where the yellow and black comes in, but PowerFlex sells that book for 40 bucks or something like that. So, I mean, you can, you can find it and I haven't dug around to find, uh, the Lassiter book, but I'm sure you can find it somewhere. And, uh, if not, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Cooper would sell you his for $1,100. So yeah, there you go. I didn't sign it. Actually, I think it is signed by Dale. So maybe 1200 <laughs> Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, Ranch Right. Does a year's worth of tax prep stand between you and being able to send things to your accountant? Are you tired of email after email asking for documents that you don't know how to find? Are you wondering exactly how much money you're going to owe the IRS this year and have no clue how to even start to figure that out? We've been there, but you don't have to. Hire Ranch Right today and know where your business stands. After all, taxes are a part of life, but RanchRight helps you with data entry, bookkeeping, gives you reports that you can make sense of, and helps with a realistic outlook of what your business needs this tax season. Visit www.ranchrightllc today and cross tax prep off your list. Yes, so um, I I think what's another piece of this that's very interesting to me in in the story of your family and your ranch is the culture that even at that time was open to experimentation, you know, and, and that's a, maybe just a bit deeper, deeper level than the way I earlier asked the question about Chase and what was, what was the genesis of that, you know, but just the culture, I think that that it speaks more to a culture that is open to, new ways of thinking and trying to improve and trying to sharpen the ax and trying to master, you know, uh, achieve mastery, you know, which is kind of one of those things that, um, soil health is, is a continuum, right? It, I, I don't think we have found, I don't think anybody has found the upper limit of what healthy soil is and can be. And even the people who've been doing it longer than anybody else and doing it better than anybody else, nobody has has 
said, okay, now I'm done improving this. It can't possibly be better than it is now. It just continues to compound and cascade in, in its positive effects. And I, I think that's mastery too. Like you never actually get there. You don't actually reach that point, but you continue to try and, and improve where you're at. So can you speak to that culture that, that was open to experimentation? My family's really, um, really fascinating. We're very, so I'm fifth generation, six generations on the ground and just like all generational producers we're we're conservative, um, by default, you know, you, you need to be conservative, um, because it's very different than my great, great grandfather who founded this place. He was a pioneer and he made it so he could lose it. And that has a different feeling with something that mm. has passed down to you with a legacy attached to it. it all of a sudden you, you play your cards a little bit differently yet with that, especially in the fourth generation. So my uncle Chase, my dad and my uncle Witt really started to search for um, what is possible. And I think that that's kind of the underlying theme of that culture that I have wholeheartedly embraced and maybe took it and ran with it um, in some instances too far and certainly made made people uncomfortable, but just this constant search for what is possible that might've been that, that might've come from when my grandfather was killed in a plane crash when he was in his fifties and, um, no one was ready to take over the ranch. Uncle Chase was oldest and I believe he was 26 or 27 at the time. And he is in the middle of a very promising banking career in California. And, um, my dad was 24 at the time and certainly not ready. And same with uncle Witt, they're twins. And, uh, so they came home and it was, it was advised by all, all forms of counsel to sell the ranch. And then dad and uncle Witt and uncle Chase just, they couldn't do it. They're, 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 They're like, we'll be, we'll be damned if we sell this place mm-hmm. um and so that might be where that was born about was we're, we're going to make this work we have to be creative we have to find what is possible while while shepherding and stewarding what we have um so that might be this the spark of that culture it, it's probably a reignition of that because of who my great great grandfather was he was a, certainly a resilient, very savvy, very humble pioneer. Mm. And, and so, yeah, I think it's that mix between, you know, really stewarding what we have, but also knowing that, and this is something that I took hook, line and sinker and just saw the writing on the wall when I was in, a teenager was you just can't we can't keep doing what we've always done. It's not going to work. We won't have a ranch by the end of my career if we did. Mm. And so I, that's why I became very, very hungry and intent on going out and learning from people who are doing things differently in a progressive way that, that was building soil and growing more grass and, and breeding for the right type of cow in order to graze the way that you need to graze. I was very serious about that. And that is still what drives me because we've got to find a new way. There's got to be a new model. And what's been so encouraging is that I think that what we've been finding out here is, is very, very promising. And I think it is breaking through towards that toward, you know, this building this momentum to take it to the sixth generation. Um, and that for me is what, what it's all about. That for me is why I'm here talking to you about composites is because I think that that that's part of the answer for us in our system, I'm not saying for everybody, but for us in our system and what we're doing, that's part of the key moving forward. Yeah. W- was your great, great grandfather, um, came to bear land. Uh, is that right? Came to that place. There was nothing there when he got there. So he, let's see, he walked across, he, he was, basically an orphan when he was 17 his 
his family immigrated from Germany when he was two. They ended up in Illinois. And then when he was 17, he and his brother and two friends basically walked out from Illinois to the Gallatin Valley, which is Bozeman, Montana, following a, a wagon train. And that was in 1864. And um, anyway, he got into freighting. And from freighting, after numerous years of freighting, he'd buy old used up oxen, fatten them on grass and sell them to mining camps. And that's basically how he got into ranching. He bought, he became very successful and he bought and sold ranches all over the state. And at the end of his career, he had two main ranches, Seepin Ranch and Seepin Livestock and two daughters. And each daughter got a ranch, but both of those ranches he purchased from other um, settlers. Yeah. But the pie, it, I mean, it still speaks walking basically from Illinois to, to the Gallatin Valley. It still speaks to that pioneering spirit and, um, I'm I'm trying to think of the p- polite way to say this, just courage, courage. I mean, mm-hmm. incredible courage, incredible fortitude, you know, all of those things. Um, and, and, you know, uh, frug- frugality, <laughs> all yes. of those things, you know? So it, yeah, I think it all contributes, you know, you're though we call it a heritage for a reason because it does influence who we are even still, you know, to this day. And so I guess, was that um, time when your your grandfather was killed? Um, was that time? Was that also in the eighties? Would that have... that was in seventy six? Okay, so kind of right on the front end of the eighties. So um, I think those those periods too probably contribute to uh, if you're going to survive this, you're going to have to think and do differently than than maybe you have been used to thinking and doing, you know, is that? Yeah, I agree. And I think that we're in similar times now, (laughs) you know. I would also agree with that. (laughs) So, you know, continuing on with, with the composite discussion, um, I think that there is a, a possibility of tipping the scale too far one way or the other. You know, you can sacrifice, uh, productivity for efficiency and vice versa, you know? And so I, I think that have you, have you, have you had to continually manage that balance or is that maybe I'm making a false dichotomy? Maybe it's, it's not, uh, maybe it's not a, maybe that's not true. I don't know if you're making a false dichotomy. I think it's very, uh, possible. Uh, I haven't had to, manage it per se because we haven't gotten out of whack in either either end but so what we're paying t- attention to and really really the focus behind this is just very functional genetics that's it just functional genetics can you define what you mean by that calving ease in a in a lower birth weight calf that's super vigorous and stacks on weight quickly is very healthy a cow that is highly fertile and raises a healthy calf i mean in end of the day it's how many pounds are weaned per acre with as little a cost as possible so whatever goes into that plus functional from the standpoint of i'm not i'm not uh, closing my eyes to what happens after they leave the ranch i'm not going to be ignorant of that i'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to be highly sensitive to what kind of a product we're actually producing mm-hmm. and so we've been we're we're keeping track the calves what what they're like when they're born um you know we've been breeding our our heifers to our own home race composites for a number of years now and we calve out up in the mountains and we're riding through them every day and it's a we we have to pull some calves but it's about a 4% pull rate which is acceptable so we keep track of that we keep track of breed ups um and then we also have had different routes. We've been part of Country Natural Beef for a number of years, and so we get we get their performance in the feedlot because we retain ownership on them through the feedlot. So we get feedlot performance, and I actually, as well as carcass data, and I kept track of our composites versus our our own sieving co- composites that we've been developing, and they outperform everything else in the feedlot. So they're outperforming on the ground, they're outperforming in the feedlot, and then we also have an outlet of. Uh, sell to a grass-fed beef company in Missoula, Montana. And so we've got a feedback loop 
on how that product is in a grass fed form. And it's all very, very positive. And so we're just keeping track of everything that, that adds to the bottom line in a meaningful way without getting tunnel vision on anything. Right. Just kind of keeping it all in, in balance. Are other programs different enough that you don't get a, um, that you don't get docked for, you know, carcass yield and, and for some of those things? Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that these animals are smaller at finish than some of their conventional brothers and sisters. Am I right? Than conventional. Yeah, certainly. Um, but no, we haven't gotten docked, uh, but I would imagine part of that might be because it is country natural beef. It is, which is a short fed program. So they are going to be lighter carcasses to begin with. Plus a lot of the producers in that I think would be of the same right. philosophy as us and where they do probably have smaller animals. Um, but then again, you know, when we have sold yearlings on the video, oftentimes we're top of the market because feeders like composites. They know mm. our, cattle they know our genetics and they know that they'll feed well and and also something not to be not to be diminished either is part of the reason that they i think that they feed out so well is because of the handling that they've had we take low stress livestock handling very very (laughs) seriously we've been serious students of bud williams for two decades and have a lot of improvement to go but part of the part of the benefit of adopting that type of philosophy and working cattle the way that we do is, is we're, we're teaching, we, we want animals that are sensitive and respond well to pressure, but they can also handle pressure psychologically can handle mm-hmm. pressure because they know that there's a release. And so when our critters go, when they get shipped, I've had calls from buyers where they're like, Hey, there was only a 7% shrink on these. Are you sure that your scale is okay on that? And usually it should be at this dis- distance, it should be 14%, but they're back again the next year buying them. Like it, the reason there was a 7% shrink was because they, they weren't stressed out. Right. And then they're back again buying the next year because they fed out so well on that end. They can handle, they can handle pressure. They can handle stress. They're just emotionally and psychologically fit for that. Yep. Sorry, another segue, funny story. I, I'll never forget the first time I reached out to you to talk on the podcast, and, and your first response was, are you sure you don't want to talk to my uncle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the famous one. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, to, my, to my chagrin, I still haven't done. You know, to my shame, I still oh, haven't, he- I haven't talked to yeah. him. So, uh, but we'll get that done. Lord willing, eventually we'll get that done. But anyways, so, so another piece of this that sounded important to me was the experimentation aspect of it. And what you said was, and in the original, uh, back in 2006, the original composite, uh, experiment was 10%. Is that right? 10% of the bull battery was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Smaller. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't near half. Or anything like that. No, and so then you you rattled off. You know, fail fast, fail cheap, fail forward, right? And right. And so these safe to fail trials, as some some would call them. You know, if I fail at this, it's not going to break the. You know, it's not. I'm not betting the farm on it. Literally, uh, it's just something that we're going to try and, and keep an eye on and see how it works. So um, has that has experimentation continued to be a, be a part of it? This have you continued to research breeds and find new breeds and say, well, let's see what they can bring to this, uh, to this herd. Yeah. That I would say that that ethos has stayed strong throughout this entire process. So when we first started developing what I'm calling the Sieben composite is it's basically Rodokovich composite. There's some Leachman composite genetics back in there, but mostly Rodokovich. And then I, I basically took like a made like a balance sheet of what our strengths and weaknesses were as a herd and tallied up all the weaknesses and then tried to find a breed that would address all those weaknesses and found this breed called Obrac, A-U-B-R-A-C, which is a French breed. Obrac is a region in France that's high altitude, cold climate, very short growing seasons, um, don't really grow much grain. So that that breed had been selected for their doability off of grass for um, centuries. And, uh, so also 
majority of the composite that we'd had once you tallied up the actual percentages of the breeds that made up that composite were majority British. And so I was wanting a, a continental for a higher outcross for higher heterosis, more hybrid vigor, but also wanted smaller, you know, moderate, smaller frame. And Obrock is a, a moderate to smaller frame continental breed with a high meat to bone ratio, highly fertile, good mothering instinct, uh, lower milking ability, but higher milk fat. Um, they've won a bunch of the uh, grass fed beef competitions in France and in Ireland. Anyway, I found an Obrock bull and here in Montana, it was, a, the rancher was going to hire, just haul him into the, the auction ring in town. He was retiring him as a six year old stud. And so I was like, well, we'll, we'll buy him. So we bought the six year old Obrock bull. And, um, there's two ways that we select bulls. One is riding through our six year olds, well, riding through our mob, which is all our cows that are three-year-olds and up, and selecting anything that's six years old and up that fits our criteria. If it has a bull calf, and this happens during the first cycle, calving in the first cycle. If it ha- happens to have a bull calf, I don't care what the calf looks like. We'll rope it and put a tag in its ear, and then it stays intact during branding. The second way that we pull that we select for bulls is putting a bull in early, like a month and a half early on our calving first calf heifers for 30 days. So these are two year olds. They start calving 25, 30 days later after they start calving, we'll drop a bull or bulls in of our choosing. And then we'll pull them three weeks before the rest of the bull battery goes out. Mm. So they breed the elite of the elite, the most fertile heifers in that peer group. And so that's what we did with this Obrock bull is to your point, a smaller, safe experiment because it's not like there's going to be many calves and uh sure enough we only had six half-blood obrock bulls that next that following april and um sorry six half-blood obrocks three of which were bulls that following april and then once they're yearlings we put them them in early on our calving first calf heifers to get the quarter bloods and we paid attention to what those quarter blood calves were like saw that there was low birth weight and they're built right. They're built like little torpedoes. And then we started collecting those half blood Obrock bulls and AIing them to our heifers. And pretty soon we had hundreds of quarter blood Obrock calves and we just kind of hit the pause button because I wanted to see, I wanted to make sure it wasn't moving our carcass traits or feedlot performance backwards because everything else had been moving in a positive direction. And, um, we got, <clears throat> all the data back and all the, everything. And on that end of it, feedlot and carcass was also moving in a positive direction. So once that happened, then we're all in majority of our bull battery is all home raised now. And of that, a majority are quarter blood obrocks. And then we're, so we're now in the middle of what I'm calling phase two of building our composite, which is stacking composites on top of composites. So we're taking those quarter bloods, we're putting them in early, on our cabin first calf heifers, um, which are all full composites by now. And by doing that, we're tightening the bell curve. That's one thing I didn't mention earlier is, is even though you have a higher genetic variation in a composite because you have five or more breeds under the same hide, it actually narrows the bell curve for genetic expression. So you'll get, you'll get a more uniform calf crop with a true composite than you will with even a, uh, purebred herd and so in this phase two where we're stacking composites on top of composites it did tighten that bell curve and that's one of the things i noticed this last fall when we we're sorting through our our bull calves there was i mean they were just all cookie cutters it was unbelievable um and we hit the pause button on that it was just a one year on the phase two to give it some time and, and start getting some feedback let that feedback loop come around. Um, I was very impressed. We were very impressed with those uh, bull calves and the heifers looked great, but that report card hadn't come in. And then, Oh, this part of the country, everyone's breed ups were down in this part of the country this last year. And those, as well as ours were a few ticks down, but those phase two heifers, yearling heifers bred up at a hundred percent under the same management. So mm. 
that's very encouraging. Maybe it's a fluke. There's a lot of very variables right. in that, but it's also encouraging. And so after that, now it's like, all right, I'm all in on phase two. We'll do that for a number of years. And then phase three will be bringing in another outside breed, which um, I did last time I visited with you, I was saying, you know, I'd, I'd love to find and source some Drakensberger semen, which is this breed in South Africa. And because of that, I was actually contacted by a guy who knew of a guy in Australia who had a Drakensberger semen and he's, he now has it here in the States. And I tried getting some this last summer, but it kind of fell through. So anyway, that's potentially one route that we'll go for the next, for the, what I'm calling phase three. And then we just kind of keep compounding that phase four will be just stacking composites on top of composites. If we get to phase five, it's another outside breed or maybe another outside composite. So, um, is that just from a practical standpoint, as far as getting semen from other countries, are there some countries that are easier to get it from than others? I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's from what I've been told, it's almost impossible to get semen from Africa. And so this Drakensberger semen was coming from a producer in Australia. How do you remove the the static, you know, to your point about maybe it was a fluke (laughs) that a hundred percent breed up or whatever, you know, how do you, have you found a way to remove the static? I just think that we're managing so many variables, right? When we, when we start to think holistically, we, 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 we start to recognize how many things are actually influencing it. And, you know, from even, well, it was 95 degrees the day we turned the bulls out or whatever, you know, I mean, there's so many of these variables that can introduce static noise into these experiments. So do do you have a method for, uh, uh, compensating for that or for removing it? I mean, some, some scenarios, all it is, is just static soup. (laughs) And then other scenarios you can actually boil down to, um, well, here's two good examples. So ever since we moved our calving date, from February and March that first year, they made the jump to May 15th. And and then after that, it was June 10th and we'd been in June 10th for a long time. And two years ago, we moved it back to like May 28th. But ever since changing the calving date, we've had a heck of a time getting our cows to breed back. And that's part of this. There's two real pushes from me for like really getting our genetics, right? One is to graze the way that I, that it's obvious that we need to graze. And two is so that they can also do so and perform at the same time. So breed back, raise a good calf. And, oh, I'd been, so once I came and came into this seat and was at the helm 10 years ago, I was really trying to get this breed back thing figured out. And, and it was just year after year, you couldn't, you think they're going to come in and they, our goal is to breed up in the low nineties and we'd be in the high eighties. We'd be in the high eighties. And it's just felt like I was hitting my head off the wall. Um, cause everything, you know, it seemed like there's a lot of cycling patties were hitting flat. We're taking nut ball samples every month. Uh, they should be, they should be good. Right. But we're, you're kind of in the middle of the storm and I was almost at my, at a breaking point where I was just, it just didn't make sense and it was driving me nuts. And so we'd had a NRCS agent coming out and taking fecal samples for nut ball analysis, which stands for nutritional balance where it tests the crude protein and amount of energy and, and mineral levels and correlated with that cow's diet, what she's getting, what she's eating. And a part of that test is you have to body condition score the cows and it, which is subjective, but it was the same NRCS agent every month, which takes a lot of the subjectivity out of it. And so, um, I pulled all the data for the last, it had been 10 years, I think on those nutball samples and grafted out from May through October. I graphed out the crude protein level and then I graphed out the body condition score and then the, the correlating breed back for that year, just to see if there's any rhyme or reason. Cause we couldn't make sense of it on the ground. Just didn't make sense. We we're, we we're trying so hard. Um, cause part of the question was, should we supplement the cows through breeding? Um, and when that's a, when that decision is on you and it's a decision that's, 
you know, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. And you go out in August, right before bulls go out, it's like, no, their body condition six, their patty, their patties are hitting flat and sloppy. There's no way I can justify spending tens of thousands of dollars right now. So it was like, I really needed just like this rule of thumb management direction to help me do my job and, and clear out this static noise that you're talking about. And so what became clear was, oh, and this is also what was frustrating was, um, you know, all, all the science that's done, uh, has been done based off of a different model, you know, calving and body condition score five is like the number one determinant for whether or not a cow breed, breeds back or one of the, one of the main determinants. Um, for us, that certainly wasn't true. Our cows are always in calving and body condition five, but if our cows are calving in body condition six, that they could have a constant slide in body condition through the remainder of the year and breed back in the nineties. So that was one rule of thumb that became clear. The other was if they're gaining or maintaining condition the month prior to bull turnout, they'd breed back in the nineties. Mm. If, if they were, did not calve in body condition six, which doesn't happen very often and lost body condition the month prior to bull turnout, then they'd be, they would not read it back in the nineties. Mm. So then the, that, that quieted all the static. It's like, this is what's happening, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners right now are like, well, duh, <laughs> you know, like, of course, but for us, it, it was a hard thing to navigate through. There was a lot of noise going on. Um, a lot of variables to try and sift through heat, flies, water, grass, um, mm. predators, all of what you're talking about. Um, so the rule of thumb now is, well, if they're not body condition six, when they're calving, we're buying supplement and we're going to supplement three weeks prior to bulls going out. Sure. That's it. Yep. And so that was a huge relief to have that. I've heard it said before that, uh, sometimes it's okay, or it's even good to have, uh, variations in body condition throughout the year. And I, and I'm wondering if that's also contributing factor. Like, uh, you said if they're not, if they were losing body condition prior to turnout, or if they were not gaining body condition prior to bull turnout, that that affected the breed back negatively. And I'm, I'm wondering if that, well, maybe if they slip a little bit prior to, uh, you know, a month or two prior to bull turnout and then they're gaining, you know, they're getting back into, they're gaining, they're on the uphill climb. They're, they're on a positive plane of nutrition, uh, prior at bull turnout. If that, if that would also contribute positively or, or is that, do you think that's correct? I've heard people say they'd rather have a, a, a thinner cow on the gain prior to bull turnout than a fat cow right that's stagnant yep the, um i think that gain is crucial and you know my my uncle chase is he's a real sheep man and he's like yeah for sheep like it doesn't matter what kind of condition they're in for bucking season as long as as long as prior to turning rams out they're on the gain two weeks prior to rams going out and for the first two weeks yeah right and that, and I mean that's that goes to flushing right in those mm -hmm. uh, in those situations you're flushing them and 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 getting more twins getting more multiple births generally when you when you have them on the gain and they're cycling harder so and that's a big right. part of profitability as I understand it in the sheep business is is uh, multiples and and getting them to survive so mm -hmm. um, a couple of things as we point towards wrapping up here. Um, for, how do you manage gestational lag? I mean, you've alluded to it here uh, that you you did that uh, that the the um, phase two part of that phase two experiment was that we're pausing it for now while we can get some of that feedback. And so, is that just what it is? It's we're gonna we're not gonna do anything for a minute <laughs> until we decide that this is a good thing to do, and then if it is a good thing to do, we'll, we'll move to phase three. Or do you take that time to to do another experiment with another group in a, in a, you know, different, with a different emphasis. Um, 
So when we hit the pause button for one year on that phase two, we just went back to what we'd been doing prior, which was taking our half blood Obrock bulls and putting them in early because we knew that that program worked. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what we reverted to, which was still, uh, significantly more progressive or advancing us towards our goals than any other option at the time that we were aware of other than potentially this phase two. Um, but now after seeing, seeing the results, we're all in on phase two and then phase three will be next. And when that happens, you know, probably in the next three years, I'd imagine. Yep. And then the, the last question that I have written down here so far is um, what has occurred to me is that there's a lot of these guys that are all about the genetics and all about finding these really functional females and functional genetics and, and all of these things, you know, they're all in on the cow side of it. But a lot of them are surprisingly to me because the only people I was exposed to were had both and approaches, but a lot of those people that are on that functional genetics journey really don't pay, pay much attention to the grazing. Is that true in your experience? You know, it's interesting that you say that. I, I can't think of basically, yes, that is true <laughs> from, and I know that there's other people that are paying attention to it, but I would say generally speaking, uh, it's, it's, you know, if you're obsessed with the type of genetic selection that you're talking about, that's where majority of your focus and energy goes and maybe less so on the, on the grazing front, um, which ours, ours, you know, we were doing the composites. This is another maybe important point. We were doing the composites, but for me, after traveling around, um, studying, I traveled around, you know, worked for other ranchers for four years after graduating college and just was really, really passionate about grazing and what you can do with grazing. And that's what really spoke to me and what I wanted to come back home and, and implement on a big way and experiment with and figure out what, what way forward. And once we, and again, it was through all these experiments and it was about eight years ago after being exposed to Johan that we started playing around with non-selective grazing and it became clear that that was the way forward. Um, However, in doing that, it also became clear that our grazing management had outpaced our genetics and we needed to take that focus and put it on breeding for the right type of cow to graze this way because we can't afford not to. To me, it seems like if you focus on the genetics and, and neglect or ignore the grazing, you've only got one pedal on that bicycle. Am I wrong? I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> you're, you, with how I see the world, you're not wrong, but... You know, and and I'm not saying that you can't do that and be profitable, but I, I think that you're leaving something on the table if you're not. Well, I think it's, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, where um, we can't keep doing what we've been doing. It's not going to work. And people, with how the cattle market is right now, um, there's a lack of... of uh, Curiosity. Or necessity. Right. You know, no, people's people aren't backed into a corner. Mm -hmm. And so the mother of invention doesn't walk into the room, you know? And so it's, um, um, that's the benefit of when times are hard is, is people, you know, really, really search for what is possible. Yep. And, um, yeah, doing searching for, for and breeding for functional genetics without a, a real intent focus on pushing the envelope in the grazing department. You're, you're leaving a lot on the table. Yes. So yep. do you, um, at, at some point, do you think that you'll, you'll get back to the non-selective grazing? I mean, no, I know you're doing that on some level through some parts of the year. I don't know if you're doing it all year, every, 365 days a year, but do you think that that, once the genetics are right, you'll be able to do more non-selective grazing than you currently are. Maybe I misunderstand what's going on there, but yeah. So we basically do non-selective grazing, um, all winter long with two different herds. We've got a, our coming two and coming three year olds in one herd. Um, and they're getting moved anywhere from two to three times a day and just taking 
everything and they're on supplement they're on an on an energy and protein supplement to do that are coming four year olds and up or in one big mob um and they're getting moved once a day uh december through may 15th or so and by that point we're migrating up to the mountains and once a day that's all non-selective i mean they're taking everything there no supplement and we've been gaining body condition from december through april um two years in a row it was three quarters of body condition score gain uh which when you add that out if one body condition is 100 pounds that's two-thirds of a day two-thirds of a pound average daily gain but the reason we're able to do that is because of our cool season grasses that we have na- native grasses that are you know seven percent protein um so that it for us is our unfair advantage and then fast forward to third week of may we're migrating up into the mountains into our summer country a lot more terrain and the grace periods prior to calving will be three days and then calving will open it up to about 10 days and then ratchet it back down anywhere from five to eight depending on the terrain but the nutritional plane is much higher and for the most part they're non-selective grazes but to your point when was it two years ago last year was very humbling winter not only was it incredibly hard weather-wise but from a forage perspective it was it was unlike it was very humbling because we'd had a super dry summer there wasn't much organic matter but we had a very good september rain and so there's six to ten inches of green grass and so the nutritional the ratio from green grass to to dormant feed was way out of whack and it was as if we're grazing our cows i mean it was washy Mm. all winter Mm. as if we're grazing our cows in april for five months Mm -hmm. and so they were never content it was really hard to you they they were never full um and i mean ideally we could have been setting out straw bales or something like that but you just can't get to a lot of these places with uh large enough equipment to do that Mm -hmm. um so that was really tough so if you ignore last year and and rewind two years ago to more quote-unquote normal year um, usually cause the mob is, as I said, coming four year olds and up. So usually the four year olds are in the poorest condition, you know, they're still growing teeth. Um, they're, they're lowest in the pecking order. It's just life's tough for them. It's their first time in that scenario in that system with that, you know, there's a 800 other cows in that group that they got to navigate through. Right and and survive but two years ago the four-year-olds were um in the best condition and they they're like the first wave of our sebum composites so that's again really encouraging and dave ward the, our cow boss he and i were talking it's just like man could you imagine if the whole if and when the whole herd is like this he was saying he's like i'm, I'm gonna have to push them harder <laughs> So, I, I mean, you'd have options. You, you can either graze even more non-selectively, which I don't know how that's possible from what we're doing usually. Um, or you can leave calves on longer. You know, yeah. there's, there's just some real, right. which, real options there. Which probably contributes to better room and development and, you know, some other things that might pay dividends down the road. Leaving yeah. calves on longer, that is. Right. I agree. Yep. All the epigenetic factors that come into play. Yep. And this is, you know, I mean, this conversation is obviously scratching the surface. And I think what it indicates to me is that somebody should probably start a podcast specifically focused on these things. (laughs) And if somebody's interested in doing that, it would be a great marketing tool for somebody who wanted to sell bulls that were developed this way. And I'd be happy to help them do that. (laughs) So uh, I don't know who that would be, but reach out. I'd love to help you start it because it would be an, it would be a fascinating podcast and I think there's enough people around doing these things that would would it would be good to talk to. You know, they there would be enough of them to to be, to keep it going for a long time. So anyways, um to that to that point, is there anything just something glaring that I missed or a question that I should have asked regarding this? I don't think so, Clay. 
yeah, I think, I think you did a great job. I appreciate the discussion and conversation. Well, I, I likewise, me too. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I, I thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good stuff there with Cooper. Really appreciate him taking the time to join me uh, again on the Working Cows podcast. It was a privilege to uh, facilitate a panel discussion of which Cooper was a part at the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition's Soil Health Conference uh, here just at the end of January. The video for that is now up on YouTube. If you want to go check that out, you can watch the video of my discussion with Glenn Elzinga. Zach Smith, Cooper Hibbert, and Jay Fuhrer, and uh, and that was a, a fun opportunity. That was also episode 350 of the Working Cows podcast, so if you missed that, you can check that out in the show notes page for today as well. Looking forward to next week on the Working Cows podcast. We're going to be talking to Brian Doherty, uh, one of the team members there at Understanding Ag. We're going to be talking to him about uh, nutrient management, managing uh, the nutrient cycle, managing carbon cycle, managing water, and and all of those different things that go into managing uh, the nutrients on our place. So we'll see you again real soon with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. Next week.